Developing right now on Morning News Now, major escalation overseas. Nearly 100 days into the Israel-Hamas war, the U.S. and British militaries launching strikes against Houthi rebels in Yemen, following weeks of attacks on ships in the Red Sea. They've got a choice to make, and the, the right choice is to stop these attacks. They'll bear the consequences for failure to do so. We have team coverage as fears grow of a widening war. Plus, chaos in court as Donald Trump delivers his own closing arguments in his civil fraud trial in New York. And in California, Hunter Biden entering a not guilty plea to criminal tax charges will bring you the latest. And millions of Americans bracing for impact ahead of yet another major winter storm. And it's expected to stretch from coast to coast. We're tracking the conditions that could affect your weekend plans. And oh, the places you'll go. 2024 expected to be a big year for travel. We'll show you the top trending destinations, plus share some tips for planning your next getaway. And some good news, some things might be cheaper. I know, we already saw some deals this week and booked a couple trips we knew we had to take in there the next go. few months. So get some more tips for you. Good Very morning, smart. good to have you with us on this Friday. Yes, it's Friday. I'm Joe Fryer. <laughs> we made it to the end of the week. I'm Savannah Sellers. Thanks for being here. We're going to get started this morning in the Middle East, where the United States and Britain have carried out a barrage of airstrikes against Houthi rebels in Yemen. The U.S. and U.K. say the strikes are in retaliation for a series of attacks by the Houthis on shipping routes in the Red Sea. The Houthi attacks were in response to Israel's assault on Gaza. Backed by eight other countries, the U.S. and U.K. bombed dozens of sites in Yemen overnight, including the capital. This video, verified by NBC News, it shows eyewitness footage of explosions in a Yemeni port city. The Houthis have condemned the strikes and say it will not stop them from targeting vessels heading toward Israel. We have team coverage on these new developments. We're going to kick things off with NBC's global security reporter, Dan DeLuce, our foreign correspondent, Josh Letterman, who's in southern Israel, and White House correspondent, Monica Alba. Good morning to all of you. Thanks for joining us, Dan. Let's start with you. Just walk us through how these strikes were carried out and what they targeted. What's the Pentagon saying? The Pentagon is saying that there were a whole series of strikes. They hit 60 targets at 16 locations, including radar systems, drone launch sites, uh, munitions depots, command and control sites, uh, all across Yemen using Tomahawk missiles, fighter jets. And of course, the British also played a role. There were uh, several British fighter jets that hit at least two targets. And then you had other countries, European countries, especially uh, the Netherlands, Canada, uh, and then Bahrain playing a supporting role, providing logistics. So the U.S. is saying that they were really trying to hurt the Houthis' capabilities it, it, so they could disrupt their ability to fire those drones and missiles at commercial shipping in that vital waterway that they've been uh, really, really disrupted now. And you have major commercial shipping companies that have had to divert their cargo ships around that area and take a much longer route, which is affecting supply chains. The U.S. is also saying that they did not really focus on uh, leaders or Iranian trainers there in the area, that they were t trying also to avoid civilian casualties. We'll see uh, if that's the case. But that's how they're presenting uh, this attack. And of course, they say they tried to avoid this. They waited for weeks and weeks, kept warning uh, the Houthis to stop harassing shipping, uh, but uh, they did not heed those warnings. Josh, let's bring you in here. Who's be what's the reaction been like from around the region? And of course, tell us specifically what we've heard from the Houthis and, and Iran. Well, unsurprisingly, the Houthis are not happy about this. They are vowing uh, retaliation will be coming, saying they cannot uh, let these American and British attacks go uh, ignored. And the Iranians also are condemning this. They say uh, this is only going to fuel more violence and instability. They are joining the Houthis in saying that this is just the latest data point showing that it is the United States behind all of the instability in the region, including behind the Israel-Hamas war. But the reaction I've actually 
really been most interested in, Savannah, is from the Omanis. Oman is a U.S. ally. They are coming out today condemning this attack as well, saying that it's ironic that uh, the Houthis are getting punished while Israel is not getting punished for its war uh, in the Gaza Strip. And, you know, Dan mentioned the Bahrainis did participate in this. They are another close U.S. ally. The Saudis did not. The Emiratis decided not to as well. And so I think we're going to have to pay close attention to how some of the regional politics of this play out in the coming hours and days, even among countries that are allied with the United States. So, Monica, there is support. There is criticism. What are we hearing about all this from the president? Congress didn't approve it. So how's the White House explaining the decision? Exactly, Joe. This is something that now we understand after learning from senior administration officials overnight. The president was briefed on these options for several days, and ultimately it was on Tuesday, January 9th, that he decided to authorize these strikes that, of course, didn't take place until yesterday. Remember, this is all happening with Secretary Austin still in the hospital, recovering from that infection linked to his prostate cancer diagnosis. So this is all happening remotely, but with his involvement and ultimately they did decide that they wanted to carry out this retaliation after that concerning pattern. This had been something that the U.S. really was warning about for weeks, trying to take diplomatic approaches, trying to send every possible signal to the Houthis to essentially knock it off before they could expect something like this. So the president did write in a statement overnight, essentially trying to justify his decision here and saying that the U.S. and its partners will not tolerate attacks on our personnel or allow hostile actors to imperil freedom of navigation in one of the world's most critical commercial routes. He says he will not hesitate to direct further measures to protect U.S. personnel and the free flow of that international commerce in that critical area. And what's also notable, as you mentioned there, Joe, is the fact that, yes, the president did not seek congressional approval, but congressional leaders were briefed in advance. They knew these strikes were going to happen. And we are hearing from both Democrats and Republicans Republicans that they feel these strikes were long overdue. They're happy they say that this finally happened. But of course, there are questions now about what could happen next and whether this does escalate further. And we're hearing from Capitol Hill that, of course, they're going to be watching that very closely. But overall, they did welcome this response. All right. Grateful to our team covering this from here and abroad. Dan, Josh, Monica, thank you all. Appreciate it. Let's now bring in Hagar Shamali for more on this. She's the former spokesperson for the U.S. mission to the U.N and the former National Security Council Director for Syria and Lebanon, also the host of Oh My World on YouTube. Hagar, good morning. Thanks for being with us. So the Houthis have already vowed to continue their attacks on ships headed toward Israel. Is this joint military strike being seen as an escalation in the region? Should we anticipate a more direct response from Iran on this? Well, it's certainly an escalation, but not the kind that you would normally expect into a full-scale war. It is very clearly still, while it's on the offensive rather than the defensive, which is what the U.S., the British, and the International Navy Coalition position from before, this, this is much more on the offensive, but it's not going to escalate into something massive because, simply put, the Houthis don't have the military capabilities to attack the U.S. and the U.K. in, in the force that they would like. And the U.S. and U.K. are going to make sure that they disable their military capabilities. That's their goal in targeting things like weapons depots, command and control centers, runways, boats. That's probably why the port was hit, for example. That's going to be their focus. Now, Will we see some kind of response? Probably, because the Houthis are not rational actors. And I have to stress that enough, because I these are this is not the government of Yemen. This is not a state actor. These types of actors, when you have militants and terrorist groups, they behave like they have nothing to lose. So they probably will try, again, to attack a certain vessel. But the U.S. is going to make sure that they understand the message. And at the end of the day, these militants, the only language they understand is military language. What I, what I would expect to see is more... Iran-backed militant groups across the region try to lob again attacks at U.S. bases across the region. But again, given the warnings from the United States, they're sending a message that they're not afraid to go on the offense and really try to disable their capabilities. And so while I think things will be shaky and volatile for a bit, I do think that message will come through eventually. So, Hagar, this shipping route between Europe and Asia is something Americans are now learning a lot about. Remind us of the international safety concerns here. How do the Houthis have access to such an important pathway? 
Yes, I'm so glad you mentioned this because it's. I, I would have expected, for example, when when Josh was talking about the Omani reaction, um, that the Omani reaction, in my in my view, is absurd because this is one of the most critical waterways in the world, and Houthi militants, and by the way, no terrorist group or militants are allowed to hijack an international waterway where 15 percent of the world's goods, 12 to 15 percent of the world's goods, go through there. And when you're talking about halting shipping, hijacking that area and telling the world, no, you're not allowed to use this shipping. Apparently, something like 18 shipping companies stopped shipments through that route, through that uh, waterway, either causing them to cancel deliveries or go all the way around Africa, which significantly contributes to global inflation, to oil price increases, to cost that is, by the way, passed on to us, the consumer around the world. That's not something you want to see at any time of year. That's not something the Biden administration wants to see during an election year in particular. Hagar, very quickly, how do you see this playing out in the coming weeks? Well, I think you're going to see more volatility across the region, including in these waterways. But ultimately, these militant groups don't have the ability to take on the United States. Neither does Iran. And so I don't see this ultimately exploding into the full-scale regional war that everyone is scared about. All right. Hagar, as always, thanks for joining us. Families of hostages still being held in Gaza are preparing for a heartbreaking milestone, 100 days since their loved ones were kidnapped by Hamas terrorists. NBC News Chief Foreign Correspondent Richard Engel has that story. It's been nearly 100 days since Hamas massacred more than 1,200 people and kidnapped hundreds inside Israel. Israelis began to commemorate the milestone in the most mournful way. Families of hostages went right to the border with Gaza to shout to their loved ones. Don't give up! Stay resilient! We're coming to get you soon! The spot is painful and emotional. This is where an open-air concert was held on October 7th, when Hamas gunmen suddenly appeared in the sky and went on to murder more than 360 young men and women, kidnap dozens and according to Israeli officials, rape women. We are standing so close to you. We love you so much. Romi Gonin was kidnapped from the festival. Shortly afterwards, we met her mother, Mirav, who was on the phone with her daughter as Hamas gunmen surrounded her car and took her. I spoke to Mirav next to Romy's photograph. She was running out of here. She, she was trying to escape from here. So, it, you know, I have it in my mind. It's not just the sounds that I hear. Now I have the, the images, the pictures of what she was going through. And when you were shouting out her name, yeah. do you believe she could hear you? Yes, yes. She can either hear me or feel that I'm talking to her. I know she does. The Israeli government believes at least 100 hostages are still alive in Gaza. The White House says at least six of them are Americans. Negotiations to free them, led by Qatar and Egypt, have been stalled for weeks. Our thanks to Richard Engel for that report. For more now, we want to bring in some special guests. John Poland and Rachel Goldberg are the parents of Hirsch Goldberg Poland, an American who was kidnapped from the Nova Music Festival during the Hamas terror attack on October 7th. John Rachel, thank you so much for being here. First and foremost, one of the most important questions we can ask is just, we want to give you a chance to talk about your son. What's he like? What should we know about him? <laughs> well, that's obviously one of our favorite topics, um, as any parent loves to talk about their children. Hirsch uh, just turned 23. He was actually at the music festival to celebrate his birthday with one of his best friends. He is a curious, uh, respectful, um, vivacious, uh, voracious reader, uh, wild about soccer, loves music festivals, had just returned from nine weeks in Europe, going to six different music festivals in six different countries. He is crazy about travel. And uh, he had been planning a trip since he was in first grade when he first started to become obsessed with geography to travel around the world. And he was supposed to leave for that trip on December 27th. Um, and we ended up going to the airport in his place and giving out stickers to everyone 
who was on his scheduled flight. They've been putting up stickers all over the world, sending pictures back saying, Vietnam is waiting for you, Thailand's waiting for you, Nepal is waiting for you, come on, Hirsch, we're in India waiting for you. And, uh, you know, that's a little slice of Hirsch. Mm, it sounds just so full of life. Uh, what a joy. Um, Rachel, we also do know that Hirsch was injured, at least at the beginning of this, lost part of his arm during the attack. H have you received any communication about his condition? What is your line of communication with any type of officials like, and what information have you been able to receive from them? So the only thing that we have been able to understand from actually the hostages who were released in the uh, in the agreement that happened at the end of November is that people who were abducted early in the morning on October 7th with injuries were taken for medical treatment from our understanding. And from the video footage that we have of Hirsch getting onto the pickup truck with the, um, you know, the part of his arm that was blown off was from the elbow down. And we see that in the video. We see also some jagged bones sticking out from below where he had wrapped it with um, some sort of bandage. Um, beyond that, we know nothing, as um, I think has been widely uh, covered. There is no international aid organization on the entire planet of Earth that has gone in to see any of the originally 240 hostages who were taken, and now we have 236 remaining hostages. I, I'm so sorry, 136 remaining hostages of those. Uh, we think just around 105 are still alive and um, none of them have been seen by any international aid organization. So we have very little information. You both been front and center for the past <clears throat> nearly 100 days. Rachel, I know you said once this ordeal, it's like a slow motion trauma. Uh, John, I'll, I, I'll ask you, where do you find strength right now? Yeah, I don't know that it's strength as much as mission. We, both of us, have never in our lives, as you could imagine, been on a mission that is so laser focused on one goal. And that goal was bring home Hirsch and all the hostages alive and do it as soon as possible. So we wake up in the morning and we brush ourselves off, perhaps feeling a bit of failure because they're still not home. And we get back to work and we do it all over again and we run around the world and we do whatever we have to do because there is such an important goal and we're not stopping until we finish it. We have seen you all with the Bidens, with the Pope. Uh, we know you've had some contact, some of which you just described to us with Israeli leadership. What more needs to be done to bring the remaining hostages, including your son, back home? What are you looking for from people in positions of authority? Look, I think we all learned on the 7th of October that Hamas is a more formidable entity than maybe we had realized before October 7th. That being said, we are also talking very publicly that the United States is at the table, Egypt, Qatar, there are some formidable players at the table, and I refuse to accept or believe that those countries together cannot figure out how to be creative, how to use diplomacy, force, money, whatever it takes to bring home the hostages. We feel like we've gotten a lot of empathy and sympathy and support, particularly from the United States, and we appreciate it. But until we see the results, I refuse to let up on the gas of pushing and pushing so that these countries think more creatively and more aggressively to bring the results that we want. John Poland, Rachel Goldberg, we are thinking of you, we are thinking of Hirsch, and we really do appreciate you taking the time to speak with us this morning. Thank you so much. Thank you Thank for you. having us. I'll be thinking about you. Let's switch gears now. Well, the fate of former President Trump's real estate business is now in the hands of a judge this morning. Closing arguments took place yesterday here in New York in the civil fraud trial against him. The judge hearing the case says he hopes to have a final decision by the end of this month. Mr. Trump and members of his family are accused of inflating their business assets in order to get better terms on loans. New York Attorney General Letitia James now seeking $370 million in fines. She also wants to bar the former president from the real estate industry in this state. James addressed reporters after those closing arguments, saying she's confident the judge will rule in the state's favor. This case has never been about politics. 
a personal vendetta or about name calling. This case is about the facts and the law, and no one is above the law, and that the law applies to all of us equally and fairly. I trust that justice will be done. Let's bring in NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos this morning. Danny, always great to see you. Thank you so much for being here. So Trump was ultimately allowed to speak briefly yesterday. So I got a bunch of questions here as a warning. So do I. Because we had this whole conversation yesterday that that was denied. How did that even end up happening? And then also, uh, he did take it as an opportunity to lash out at the judge, at the attorney general. Kind of this extraordinary move on the part of a defendant. What do you make of, of what he said and of that move in terms of how it fits into the case here and his argument? First, how did that happen? It happened because Donald Trump is being treated differently than any other defendant would be in virtually any other court. There is a long-standing rule that if you are a party but you have a lawyer, unless, I mean, if you're not proceeding pro se, if you have a lawyer, the lawyer does the talking. And you want to test this theory, go into any courtroom, sooner or later the client, the party, will want to say something. They'll raise their hand or they'll turn to the lawyer and the judge says no. That's why you have lawyers. And there are reasons for that, because lawyers understand judicial efficiency. They, can, they, they know what is appropriate to say in open court and what is not. Mm. And so for that reason, there's no uh, reason I can think of why Donald Trump should have been allowed to speak, why this was even an option. You can get into a separate discussion about why would his attorneys even want him to speak. That's a whole nother, uh, that's a whole nother issue. But he never should have been allowed. And the only reason that he was is because this is a high-profile case, and I've often said that the normal rules of procedure just go out the window when you're dealing with a high-profile case, whether it's OJ, uh, whether it's this case, it doesn't matter. Uh, things happen that we just don't have any rule book for because that's not the way things work. And by the way, you know why uh, clients are not allowed to speak in open court or give closing arguments? Because they go off the rails. Exhibit A is yesterday when Donald Trump was allowed to speak. He went off the rails. Everything that Justice and Gorin was worried that he would do, he did. So if anyone learned a lesson, it was Justice and Gorin. Trump left before the AG even presented closing arguments to hold a news conference. But the AG's main, off, main, main argument here is, is the buck stops with Trump. How strong was their argument overall in this case? Well, normally I talk about betting the odds, but in this case, this is a rare case where you get a glimpse into how the judge is thinking because he already decided a large portion of this case on summary judgment before the trial even started. So if you want to say the judge is leaning towards the attorney general, just take a look at the summary judgment opinion where the judge repeatedly calls what the defendants did fraudulent. So <clears throat> even though the defense put on some interesting experts, they had accounting experts, they had Deutsche Bank witnesses. I mean, if you're betting, <clears throat> the judge in this case has already ruled against the defendant. So because this is not a jury, it's the same judge that decided summary judgment. So probably going to go in favor of the AG. The real question is, what is the dollar amount going to be? That's probably why the AG felt comfortable saying, hey, um, you know the money we asked for? <laughs> let's, let's Can we have that. some more yeah. of that money? Yeah. So no surprise there. I do want to switch gears while we have you talk about a hearing in the Georgia election interference case. So there's some drama here. This was scheduled before allegations of an improper relationship between Fulton County DA Fonnie Willis and the lead prosecutor, the special prosecutor in this case. This came to light. A spokesperson, I should say, for the DA's office said a response to the allegations will be made in a court filing and declined further comment. But walk us through what we know about that and then how that could impact what we see today. One of the defend defendants has filed a motion asking for the entire case to be thrown out because of an alleged improper relationship between the DA and the top prosecutor who was brought in and is being paid by Fulton County, by the government, uh, to prosecute this case. And the allegations say essentially that the money going to him went right back to the DA in the form of vacations and things that people do uh, when they're in a relationship. And by the way, I'll let you in on a little secret. In every courthouse in America, the judges are dating the cops, the DAs are dating the public defenders, some people are dating two cops at the same time. Not a good idea. Oh, wow. It's go Any lawyer out there listening right now is going, yeah, he's right, because that is what is going on, those kinds of clandestine relationships. So the question is, is this enough to get the, the case dismissed? I doubt it. Could they get the, the prosecutors removed from the case? Maybe. This is a motion, and this exemplifies how defense attorneys sometimes have to be the least popular people at the party. I look at that motion, I think, would I have had the chutzpah to bring that motion? Boy, it is out there, and it slings a lot of mud. But 
If it wins the case, you've zealously represented your client. Danny Sabellis, thank you for your analysis on the former Trump president's and legal issues as well as some information so on the more. dating lives. So, yes, thanks, Danny. Another political legal drama was playing out across the country yesterday. President Biden's son, Hunter Biden, made a court appearance in Los Angeles pleading not guilty to federal tax charges. The hearing came over a month after he was indicted and a day after making a surprise appearance at a House committee hearing in Washington. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ryan Nobles reports from L.A. Hunter Biden again in federal court, pleading not guilty to nine tax charges, three of them felonies that could land him in prison for 17 years if convicted. Prosecutors say Biden willfully avoided paying $1.4 million in taxes from 2016 to 2019, instead spending, quote, millions of dollars on an extravagant lifestyle rather than paying his tax bills. Inside court, Biden answering brief questions from the judge, who set a tentative June 20th trial date. Biden's legal team has argued Hunter was dealing with addiction and has since paid his taxes back. Mr. Biden, do you regret it? comes after Hunter Biden's surprise appearance in Congress, showing up at a hearing where Republicans were considering recommending contempt of Congress charges against him. Ignoring a congressional subpoena to be deposed, what are you afraid of? Hunter Biden refusing to comply with the subpoena for a closed-door testimony, saying he would only talk in public, leaving the hearing room after a few minutes. Republicans calling it a PR stunt. He was not there to answer questions. This is the second time that Hunter Biden has displayed in real time the arrogance and entitlement that he's had his entire life. First Lady Jill Biden said she was proud of the way her son has managed his recovery and blasted Republicans for showing naked selfies of Hunter during a recent hearing. What they are doing to Hunter is cruel. And I'm really proud of um, how Hunter has rebuilt his life uh, after addiction. And um, I think, you know, I'm, I love my son and it's had, it's hurt my grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm so concerned about. And the full House is expected to vote to hold Hunter Biden in contempt of Congress, possibly as soon as next week. It will then be up to the Department of Justice to determine whether or not he will be charged with a crime. All right, Ryan, thank you so much. Well, there's much more to come here on Morning News Now. Later this hour, Boeing under fire and now under FAA investigation over this mid-flight emergency. What Boeing is saying now as concerns grow about the safety of its planes. Up first after the break, the race for second place heating up, which is three days to go before the Iowa caucuses. We're going to take you to Des Moines for the latest. And a major winter storm is on the move and bringing with it heavy snow, rain, and the potential for dangerous temperatures will time out all the impacts when we return. Wow, you hear that music? We are back with the race for the White House that is heating up. It's all about to get going. It's just three days until the Iowa Republican caucuses. New polling out this week shows former President Donald Trump remains the overwhelming frontrunner with Nikki Haley ahead of Ron DeSantis in a tight battle for second place. For more, we are joined by Meet the Press moderator Kristen Welker, who, of course, is in Des Moines, Iowa. Kristen, my friend, good morning. Good to see you. So we are now entering this home stretch between now and when the caucus kicks off Monday. What are you watching out for? Hey, well, it's great to be with both of you. A couple of things we're watching for. The top question is, just as you say, Joe, does former President Trump win the Iowa caucuses? And if so, by how much? If he comes in below expectations, that could raise real questions about his strength. However, if he wins by as much as 30 points, which right now polls show he's on track to do that, that would be a record win here for a GOP race. The person who currently holds that distinction is Bob Dole back in 1988. He got nearly 13 percent of the vote. So just for comparison, think about that. Right now, Donald Trump has a 30-point lead. You talked about that race for second place. Nikki Haley, Ron DeSantis duking it out. Ron DeSantis has almost focused exclusively on the state of Iowa. So the stakes could not be any higher for him here. If he were to have a disappointing finish, for example, if he was a 
second place very far behind or third place. That could raise real questions about the viability of his campaign. On the other hand, you know that Nikki Haley's had a lot of momentum in recent weeks. If she were to finish in third place, that could raise real questions about whether that momentum is durable. And by the way, big picture, all of the campaigns are really downplaying expectations here, in part because we're expecting record low temperatures here on Monday. I talked to one Iowan caucus goer overnight, though. He said not to worry. Iowans are a hearty stock, <laughs> so they are not anticipating that it's going to impact turnout. We've been talking a lot about that. We are feeling for those people who are going to be out there in one degree. Yeah, but I'm from Minnesota. It's like, okay, get yeah, in the car, get there. True. You'll be good. <laughs> uh, exactly. Kristen, that, they're not even blinking an eye, Joe. <laughs> uh, Kristen, let's talk about a, a little of this hot mic drama from this week. So Nikki Haley's responding yeah. to these comments that Chris Christie made, caught on that hot mic. He said, quote, she's going to get smoked in the caucuses. What's she saying now about that? Well, Savannah, she told our Garrett, hey, quote, Politics is not personal for me. It is for the fellas. So she's dismissing <laughs> that criticism. She says she's saying solely focused on the caucuses here. But look, the big question as it relates to Chris Christie is what is it going to mean for this race overall? What could it mean for Nikki Haley, for example, in New Hampshire? Chris Christie gets about 12 percent of the vote right now in New Hampshire. More than half of his supporters say they are going to support Nikki Haley. So sh could she win in New Hampshire? That would be significant. It would be a big shakeup of this race. It would give her momentum heading into her home state of South Carolina. But by the way, guys, right now, Trump has a big lead in South Carolina. Yes, Haley's within striking distance of him in New Hampshire, but she's got a long way to go in South Carolina. So a lot of questions about that. And if Trump has a strong finish here in Iowa, it is going to be tough to see how the other candidates catch up and overtake him, though not impossible. All right, Kristen Welker, thank you so much. And I'm glad to see you have incredibly warm gloves Thanks, on guys. to keep those hands warm. Yeah, but you look great out there. Outside. Look at your snow outfit. Always. Kristen, <laughs> thank thanks. You. See you soon. And make sure to stay with NBC for all your Iowa caucus coverage. Kristen, along with Hallie Jackson and Tom Yamas, will have live coverage and analysis all night long Monday, starting at 7 p.m. Eastern, right here on NBC News Now. Severe weather winter alerts are in place across the country. Just like we were talking about, it's going to be cold in Iowa. For more on how this might be impacting your area, let's check on your forecast. Yep. And Angie Lassman's here. Angie, good morning. Good morning, guys. We got a colorful map to start off with uh, across the country. So many alerts. We've got wind alerts. We've got winter alerts. We've got flood alerts. Uh, and we've already seen a quite active morning across portions of the south where we're watching a tornado potential through the next couple of hours and even into the later today. Here's the tornado. We watched it last through 11 a.m. Central. You can see some of these thunderstorm warnings. We've had tornado warnings already for portions of Arkansas. This is going to be one of the many impacts that this storm has across uh, this region here as we go through the day today. We move a little farther to the north. A very difficult commute this morning in Chicago, Milwaukee. We are seeing heavy, wet snow that's going to impact folks uh, throughout the day today and even into tomorrow across portions of the Great Lakes. And not to mention, we've got some heavy rain that will leave us with the potential for flooding. But let's take a look, a closer look, I should say at that severe weather. We've got 29 million people under this potential to see some of these stronger storms developing later today. Much like what we saw earlier in the week, wind gusts topping 70, 75 miles per hour. We're dealing with the potential for some isolated tornadoes and that hail potential is there too. The system's going to be on the move through the day today. You can see all of that heavy snow draped across portions of the Great Lakes. We'll see Michigan get involved in this later today. Chicago still dealing with the heavy snow as we get into the afternoon commute and any Friday evening plans you have in those areas. Travel will be very difficult to near impossible across that region. There's the heavy rain that will work a little closer to the East Coast. And then the overnight hours and into tomorrow, the heavy rain works up across portions of the Northeast and into New England. And notice what sticks around. That lake effect snow, the snow machine will be on through Saturday across that region. So piling up, really making it difficult for any outdoor plans that people have to get anywhere across that region. When we look at our snow totals, we could see places Places like Chicago picking up maybe double digits. The last time we saw that, November 21st of 2015, it's been a while since Chicago had a significant snowfall in one day. We could see that potential. Notice those hourly rates. One to two inches per hour are likely right along the lakes. Places uh, like Grayling, up to a foot of snow. We could see a foot and a half across portions of Wisconsin, the upper peninsula of Michigan, the west side of Michigan. It's going to be a winter wonderland for a lot of folks, but it's also going to be whipping 
Freezing winds on top of that heavy snow. So again, the snow drifts will be a problem. Notice 50 mile per hour winds in Nashville, Chicago, 40 mile per hour winds. This is from New Mexico to Maine, where we could see these really impressive wind speeds. And uh, that means down trees, power lines. We dealt with all of this, these same kind of impacts earlier in the week. So we had a, a little bit of a taste of this, and now we're going to have another round. One last note, we've got really saturated grounds across the Northeast. And while the rainfall isn't quite as much as what we saw previously with the previous storm, uh, we still have very saturated grounds. And this is going to be a flash flood risk through Saturday, guys, mm. into Sunday, potentially. We know we've got a lot going on across the country. And when it comes to football games, I want to leave you with this. Wow. Dolphins versus Chiefs. Are the Dolphins going to be OK? Uh, no Two kidding. degrees yeah. Chiefs in gonna Kansas be okay. City. <laughs> Wind chill minus 19. Let That's me remind wild. you, Arrowhead Stadium is outdoors. Yep. I, I, I think certainly no, an advantage, at least for Chiefs who are somewhat used to it. Yeah, but I, the Dolphins. The Dolphins. I covered one of the coldest NFL playoff games ever uh -huh. in Green Bay. 15 years ago, you might yep. remember, Tom Coughlin with the Giants was oh, literally yes. the color pink. I was there. Ooh, uh, it was outdoors. You have all your fingers I was still. sick for a week after that, but I do have all my fingers. You so. could not pay me Exactly. Too much. It is wow. going to be a cold one. Good luck right. to teams. Thanks, Angie. Angie, oh thank gosh. you so much. Coming up, an in-flight emergency now under investigation by the FAA. Yeah, when we come back, what Boeing is saying now after this mid-air scare, you're watching Morning News Now. Welcome back. Boeing is now officially under investigation by the Federal Aviation Administration after that door plug flew off an Alaska Airlines flight midair. In a statement, the agency said, quote, this incident should have never happened and it cannot happen again. So far, the administration has grounded more than 170 planes from its 737 MAX 9 fleet. In a statement responding to these latest developments, Boeing said, we will cooperate fully and transparently with the FAA and the NTSB on their investigation. Joining us now for more on this is Jeff Guzzetti. He's a former FAA and NTSB investigator and an NBC News aviation analyst. Jeff, good morning. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, so now that they've launched this investigation, it seems like this is exactly the type of thing that you used to do. Walk us through what they'll be looking for and how they conduct this. Certainly. Uh, good morning, Savannah and Joe. So this is your standard FAA investigative process, right? They uh, give the... Uh, uh, the entity 10 days to respond if they want to respond, and then they proceed with investigating the uh, allegation of a potential violation. So they're going to be collecting evidence, and specifically, they're going to be determining whether or not Boeing is producing parts that conform with the production certificate that the FAA had provided Boeing uh, a couple of years ago when the 737 MAX came out. So it's gonna be, t it's gonna take a few months. And in the end, it might be just a warning. It might be uh, uh, re uh, required corrective action, or it could be a civil penalty. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess that's the question. What could this mean for Boeing? Is there like a worst case scenario? Well, the worst case scenario is that the FAA can determine that Boeing does not have the capability to produce parts that conform to its uh, certificate. Uh, that's that's probably highly unlikely, but that would mean that uh, Boeing would have to shut down some or all of its production lines. Uh, that's the worst case scenario. But uh, the best case scenario is uh, deficiencies are identified. Boeing promises to take corrective action, and uh, Boeing is just gets a warning from the FAA. And then every, anything in between, it could be a civil penalty of, you know, thousands to millions or uh, that's proposed. So uh, the FAA has a lot of uh, birth by which to uh, conclude this investigation. All right. Jeff Guzzetti, we really appreciate your expertise as somebody who has been through these types of investigations. Thanks so much. Thank you. Well, coming up, it's the end of an era for New England and the NFL Patriots coach Bill Belichick is stepping away from the sidelines after a legendary 24 season career. It's just the latest in a series of seismic shape ups, shake ups in the football world. We're going to talk about what it all means for the sport next on Morning News Now. It is the end of an era in the NFL. After 24 seasons, Bill Belichick is out as coach of the New England Patriots. But he's not the only legendary coach to move on from their job this week. NBC News correspondent Jesse Kirsch has more on the seismic shift we've seen in coaching over just the past few days. 
He led the New England Patriots, including superstar quarterback Tom Brady, to six Super Bowl wins. Through it all, head coach Bill Belichick never got too excited, and today was no different. For me, this is a day of um, you know, gratitude and celebration. Following a dismal season, Belichick and the Patriots are parting ways after a 24-year span that included Deflategate. He may show up on another sideline. It'll be difficult to see him in a cutoff hoodie on the sideline, but I will always continue wish him continued success, except when he's playing our beloved Patriots. Brady calling Belichick the best coach in NFL history adding, I could never have been the player I was without you, Coach Belichick. I am forever grateful. Belichick's departure, just the week's latest major audible. Alabama head coach Nick Saban stunned college football fans Wednesday, retiring after more than three decades on the sidelines. Saban winning seven national titles. The icon writing, the goal was always to help players create more value for their future, be the best player they could be, and be more successful in life. Fans celebrating the legend. Meanwhile, the Seattle Seahawks moving on from head coach Pete Carroll. One day, Belichick and Carroll could wind up enshrined here at the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Some of Saban's players could wind up enshrined here, too. New playbooks for a trio of coaches that's bigger than the X's and O's. Jesse Kirsch, NBC News, Canton, Ohio. For more, we're joined now by NBC Sports host and Sunday night play football play-by-play -play announcer Mike Tirico. Mike Good to have you with us. Thank, Thank you for joining us. No one better to talk to after a wild few days in the world of football. Yeah, really. The most successful coaches in the history of college football, the NFL moving on, not to mention Pete Carroll. I worked in Seattle right. back when he was there. Mm -hmm. or when I was there. Beloved. He has a Super yes. Bowl college football championship. We are used to shakeups at the end of the regular season when teams don't do well. But what do you make of this massive shakeup? No, nothing like this, for sure. You think about it, uh, those three the gentlemen in Pete Carroll and Nick Saban at Alabama and Bill Belichick together, college and pro football, they've won 16 championships over the last 24 years. And think about it, that's 16 out of about 48 because there's only two a year, college and pro. So it's a really remarkable stretch of Hall of Fame, legendary coaches, iconic guys. You know, I think Pete Carroll still wants to coach a little bit more. I know Bill Belichick wants to coach, and I think we'll see him back in the NFL within the next month or so. Uh, I can see him continuing. But to close the chapter on the six championships in New England in almost a quarter century, uh, it made them one of the great franchises in the history of the NFL. The Belichick-Brady combo was as good as it got in the league. So, Mike, where might Belichick end up? I know there are a lot of coaching jobs open right now. I mean, what are some front runners? I can give you a scoop. I don't know yet, but um, I, there's a Carolina and Atlanta conversation that seems to gain more volume as we go on. A couple of teams in the NFC South. The NFC South is a winnable division right now. There's no superpower team, although Tampa Bay is representing them as the division champs again in the playoffs. But there's a lot of talk about those couple of teams. You know, we want to keep an eye on the Chargers and the Raiders as well, another couple of openings that are out there. We've got a lot of options and a lot of teams who are in the mix. So I think there's going to be a market to say, hey, come get the best head coach that we've seen. And don't forget Washington, new ownership, deep pockets. They want to make a big splash. That could gain a lot of credibility back to a franchise that could use some if they bring in the, one of the winningest coaches in the history of the league going for the all-time record in wins, trying to eclipse Don Shula over the next couple of years. Mike, real quick, while we have you, we have to talk about the NFL playoffs. Yeah. What are you watching for besides making sure you have the warmest coat humanly possible? Yeah, really. Week? Well, that, 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 that's the line. Uh, we started on NBC with Cleveland and Houston, and then we're in Kansas City, and our colleague Kaylee Hartung is going to be on the sideline, and I don't envy her at all. The <laughs> air temperature for kickoff tomorrow night is about zero, and the wind chill is expected to be 25 to 30 below. So we are talking about as cold as we've ever had for an NFL playoff game. That game's exclusively streaming on Peacock on Saturday night. And then we've got three games Sunday highlighted by the last one that we'll have on NBC with the Detroit Lions playing a home playoff game for the first time in three decades. And they're playing against Matthew Stafford, who was their quarterback for 12 <laughs> years. They traded him to the Rams. The Rams won the Super Bowl. Stafford has such a great legacy in Detroit. 
it's going to be one of the best scenes we've ever seen for an NFL playoff game. That's pretty cool. A lot of folks in Detroit very excited, long overdue there. I Mike just am Tirico. so interested to see the Miami crew in negative 30. <laughs> <laughs> and on top of that, it's about, you know, on top of that, their quarterback, Tua Tonga Bailoa, is from Hawaii. So you got a Hawaiian who plays in Miami who's coming to 30 below wind chill. I don't doubt them, but that's going to be a tough task yeah, for them to overcome. Sure yeah, definitely. Mike Tirico, thank you so much. Thank Good to you. see you. So great to have you with us. My, my pleasure. Have a great morning, guys. Let's get you some financial headlines now. Tesla is suspending production overseas as those attacks in the Red Sea continue. CNBC Silvana Hanau has that and other money news. Hey, Silvana, good morning. Hey, Joe. Hey, Savannah. Good morning to you from a very warm studio. <laughs> Tesla plans to halt production for two weeks at its factory near Berlin as a conflict in the Red Sea continues to disrupt shipping traffic. Tesla says the stoppage is due to a lack of parts needed at the plant. Now, the disruptions are causing shippers to seek longer and more expensive alternative routes to transport products from Asia to Europe and elsewhere, such as around southern Africa. The price of Bitcoin is pulling back today as hype in recent days about the launch of new Bitcoin exchange traded funds following approval by the SEC dies down. The cryptocurrency rallied above $49,000 yesterday. That's a level it hasn't hit since the end of 2021. The dozen new Bitcoin ETFs saw more than $4.5 billion in trading volume on their first day. These funds allow investors to buy and sell Bitcoin without having to pay high fees as they would if they bought it directly on a crypto exchange such as Coinbase. And peeps are polarizing. You either love or hate the marshmallow candies. I don't love them, but they are an Easter staple every year. And the brand announcing its holiday lineup for 2024, including four new flavors, Rice Krispie Treats, Icy Blue Raspberry, Sour Strawberry, and Delight S'mores Graham Cracker dripped in chocolate. The new Peeps varieties are available exclusively at select retailers, including Sam's Club, Target, and Cracker Barrel. Peeps have been marketed in the U.S. and Canada since 1953, guys. You know what Savannah loves is the Peep it's flavor drink Pepsi. Them. Yes, to drink, drink that. Ooh, we did Joe is like Buddy like, the Elf. I mean, anything, he'll just yeah, take just, it down. I'm like a bee. Anything yeah. sweet, I'll <laughs> No, I'll drink it. So. No, no. <laughs> so, no. Thank you so much. <laughs> Coming up, want to get away? Hey, you're not the only one. 2024 expected to be a huge year for travel. When we come back, we'll tell you about some of the top trips that are trending. Buckle up. This is Morning News Now. We're back with a pretty, pretty funny goodbye from one of HBO's longest running series. The network just released the trailer for the 12th and final season of Curb Your Enthusiasm. Take a look. I'm disappointed. I was expecting more from a childhood hero. I really did the best under the circumstances of a person who hates people and yet had to be amongst them. I want to know more about those glasses. All right. Yeah, Fans really? have spent nearly 25 years laughing at Larry David over the top antics from his daily life in Hollywood. The show earned a total of 51 Emmy nominations, oh two Emmy wins for season 12. Looks like David is going to be going out with a comedy bang. You can catch the final season starting February 4th on HBO and She's Love it. One I know. Yeah. It's I mean, incredible. deserving. But of yeah, course. wow, that's so amazing. Funny. All right, can't wait for that. Well, we end the hour looking at some of the travel trends for the new year. After a record breaking season for holiday travel, experts say they don't see the demand for getting away for getaways slowing down anytime soon. Check out this stat. It comes from a new report from the travel platform Hopper. 77% of travelers plan to spend the same or more on travel in 2024 as they did last year. Well, joining us now to discuss is Haley Berg. She's the lead economist at Hopper. Haley, thanks as always for joining us. So if so many people are planning to do that, let's talk about what it's going to cost them. Last year, we saw airfare prices increase. What about this coming year? Is there any relief? Great news for travelers, whether you're headed domestic or international, is prices are a lot lower headed into this year. Domestic airfare for January down to about $250 per round trip ticket. That's down 6% from last year. And our forecast is that prices are going to remain below last year and pre-pandemic levels all the way through July at least. That's some good news, Mariah. I know we're already seeing some deals out there even in just the first couple of weeks of the year. So Haley, people, where do they want to go this year? What are some of the top domestic and international destinations? Right now, a lot of travelers are focused on warm weather destinations. It's pretty chilly up here in the north. So we're seeing lots of Vegas, Cancun, and Orlando for some of those Disney trips are the most popular right now. 
But looking longer haul international, London and Tokyo are already trending very hot for this year, as well as Paris. Obviously, July and August will be very busy if you're headed to Paris for the Olympics. And we expect all of France to be trending throughout the year. Oh, interesting. All of France to be trending. Yeah, okay. So Probably also be... very pricey. I'm guessing you won't find <laughs> yeah. a lot of deals in Paris deals in, in July Paris. and August. Yeah. Or Rome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, Haley, tell us, we've just got about a minute left, but if you're looking to get away, how can Joe mention there's been deals already? How can you find them? The most important thing is to plan early enough. American travelers are planning most of their vacations about two weeks later than they used to, and that means they're missing out on the lowest prices. So start monitoring the price right now of that trip to Europe. If you're planning to go this summer, if you're thinking about a spring break getaway, start monitoring prices now. Use something like the Hopper app. Get notifications when prices are at their lowest. That's the number one best way to get a good deal. So basically with the Hopper app, we can kind of get alerted if where we want to head gets cheaper. We'll send you a notification for your specific trip, your origin, destination, your dates, awesome. and we'll say, hey, this is the lowest price. You should book it now. All right. That three to four months is tough, but if you can do it, I know you can save yeah, some money. So. Definitely. All I right. know. We're, I'm not the best planner, but yeah, I should work on it. <laughs> three to four Haley days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Haley Berg, thank you very much. Happy traveling. It's going to do it for this hour of morning news now. Stay with us, though, because the news continues right now. Let's start with good news. It's Friday. Yay. Hello. I'm Savannah Sellers. I'm Joe Fryer. Developing right now on Morning News Now, a violent escalation in the Middle East. U.S. military forces, along with several allied nations, including the U.K., levy a series of strikes on Iran-backed Houthi rebels in Yemen. It comes after weeks of aggressive attacks by those rebels on shipping vessels in the Red Sea. We've got the very latest from the ground. Disorder in the court. A furious former President Trump rants against the New York judge presiding over that high-stakes civil fraud trial which wrapped up closing arguments yesterday. Now that judge is set to decide whether Mr. Trump should be permanently banned from the state's real estate industry when we could see that final ruling. We're also tracking yet another blast of severe winter weather. It's bringing a whole lot more snow and frigid temperatures to the Midwest. Farther south, rain, hail, and tornadoes rocking millions of Americans for the third time this week. And the system is not showing any signs of slowing down or watching at all as it barrels east. And of course, if it's Friday, you know we've got your weekly can't miss list on deck with the highly anticipated return of an HBO powerhouse series, True Detective. I love True Detective. I love Jodie Foster. Very excited for that. Yes, I know. I know you love that. You're, show. you're excited for Mean Girls. I, I am excited yes. for Mean Girls. And actually, a fabulous, brilliant friend of mine is one of the producers on it. So I'm so excited oh, for good. it. It's getting really good reviews so yeah. far. Yeah. yeah. So it's good. Excited about All that. All right. More on that <laughs> in a little bit. We're going to, of course, begin this hour with the latest from the Middle East, where the U.S. and Britain carried out a joint strike mission against Iran backed Houthi rebels in Yemen, hitting dozens of targets. Yeah, the move comes after weeks of mounting attacks led by the Houthis against shipping vessels. Traveling to Israel through the Red Sea, NBC News Chief Foreign Correspondent Richard Engel brings us the details from Jerusalem. The Pentagon has been threatening to carry out these strikes for weeks in order to protect freedom of navigation in the Red Sea. But the Houthis are undeterred and immediately promised retaliation. The U.S. and British militaries overnight carried out air and naval strikes against militants in Yemen in retaliation for attacks on commercial ships in the Red Sea. The strikes further escalate the war in the Middle East, which the Biden administration has been seeking to avoid, and draws the United States deeper into the conflict. U.S. officials said American aircraft launched from the USS Eisenhower and bases in the region to hit at least a dozen targets in Yemen, including airports, military bases, and weapon storage facilities. The purpose, the Pentagon said, was to deter the Yemeni militants known as the Houthis, who have carried out more than two dozen attacks on commercial vessels in the Red Sea since Hamas's October 7th massacre and Israel's devastating response in Gaza. 
The Houthis, who are backed by Iran, say they only target ships bound for or connected to Israel, a claim the Biden administration disputes. In a statement, President Biden said the operation sends a clear message that the United States and our partners will not tolerate attacks on our personnel or allow hostile actors to imperil freedom of navigation. The Houthis vowed to retaliate and continue attacks in the Red Sea, calling them a defense of Gaza, where the health ministry run by Hamas says more than 23,000 Palestinians have been killed so far. In Israel, they've already begun mournful commemorations to mark 100 days since Hamas killed 1,200 people and took hundreds of hostages. Families of hostages went right to the border with Gaza to shout to their loved ones. Omer, can you hear us? They gathered where an open-air music festival was held on October 7th, when Hamas gunmen arrived at dawn in paragliders and murdered more than 360 young men and women and kidnapped dozens. Romy Gonen was kidnapped from the festival. I spoke to her mother, Mirav, next to Romy's photograph. Do you believe she could hear you? Yes, yes. She can either hear me or feel that I'm talking to her. I know she does. The Israeli government believes more than 100 hostages are still alive in Gaza. The White House says at least six of them are Americans. Richard Engel, thank you very much. Let's bring in NBC News Chief International Correspondent Keir Simmons for more on this. Keir, I know you spoke with British Foreign Secretary Lord David Cameron earlier today about this strike. What did you learn? That's right. And effectively what he says is that uh, the U.S. and the U.K. had no choice, that this was an act of defense. Uh, to read between the lines uh, or to put it a another way, the U.S. Uh, and the U.K. has drawn a red line uh, with the Houthis saying you should not attack international shipping in the Red Sea. And as they carried on doing that, David Cameron says, effectively, as I say, they had no choice uh, but to act. I think the questions and the question I wanted to ask him was, how much have they done to actually damage the Houthis' ability to do this? Take a lesson. When you have attack after attack, even though you've had warning after warning, ultimately uh, this military action was necessary. I think it was proportionate, it was legal, it was absolutely right to do, and I think it sends a very clear message to the Houthis, but also to Iran as well. Does this military action, though, prevent the Houthis from continuing to target commercial shipping in the Red Sea? Well, obviously, it sends a very clear message to the Houthis that we are prepared to act in self-defense in this way. But a message and, is different from degrading well, their capability or even preventing them obviously from Obviously, these attacks will degrade their capability. That's important. And we'll get the assessments later today about exactly how much of that has been done. But the fact is, since the 19th of November, there have been 26 attacks. We've tried warnings. We've had the UN Security Council resolution. I spoke to the Iranian foreign minister. Warning after warning has been given, and yet the attacks continued. At the same time, uh, Joe, this is an escalation, uh, as Richard was saying in his piece, and you can see that from the reaction, condemnation from uh, President Erdogan of Turkey, Oman condemning the action, uh, asking why Israel, persi well, Israel persists in its bombing and siege, as Oman says, of the Gaza Strip without accountability or punishment. And then there's this, this action against the Houthis, the Saudis, clearly very, very worried. They neighbor Yemen. And they had an eight-year war uh, with the Houthis, which, in eight years, didn't manage to silence the Houthis. Mm. Kier, do we know if we plan to see more of this, the U.K. carrying out strikes alongside the U.S.? I asked David Cameron exactly that uh, question, Savannah, and he said we will do what we need to do. And I suspect that what we will see now is the Houthis work very hard to try to show they can still hit international shipping in the Red Sea. And then that puts the US and, and the UK and the other countries that are part of this coalition, though they didn't take part in the strikes, uh, it puts them in a position where uh, the, the White House, where it has to do something again. And, and that's, I think, the, one of the real dangers is whether or not we're now in a cycle of the US, the White House, the UK having to react every time the Houthis do something. Keir Simmons, thank you so much for joining us with your reporting this morning. We really appreciate it. Let's get more domestic reaction to all this with NBC's congressional correspondent, Julie Serkin. Julie, good morning. Good to see you. So we understand that Congress did not approve this, but they were briefed on this. Tell us the reaction from congressional members who support these strikes. 
That's exactly right. Good morning, guys. Look, Republicans specifically have been urging the Biden administration to get more directly involved in going after Iran since basically the start of those Hamas attacks against Israel on October 7th. That being said, the Biden team, Democrats, have been cautious because they didn't want to escalate uh, and broaden involvement in the conflict in that region. Following these strikes overnight, though, many, several, uh, many senior Republicans and Democrats praise the Biden administration for conducting these strikes. I'm talking about folks like Minority Leader Mitch McConnell in the Senate. He said, quote, I welcome the U.S. and coalition over operations against the Iran-backed Houthi terrorists responsible for violently disrupting international commerce in the Red Sea and attacking American vessels. He went on to say that Biden's decision to use military force against these Iranian proxies is overdue. That was echoed by Speaker Johnson, other senior Republicans as well in the Senate, who backed the Biden administration up for their decision here uh, to join the coalition and conduct these strikes. Julie, on the flip side, you have several lawmakers saying this action by President Biden violates the Constitution because he didn't get that authorization from Congress. Uh, what are we hearing from the critics? He didn't get that authorization, but as you said, they did notify about this operation that could potentially happen earlier in the week. They didn't get that formal approval, though, and that's why you're hearing particularly some progressive voices on the Democratic side slamming this move. For example, Cory Bush uh, posted on X saying that uh, he can't launch uh, airstrikes in Yemen without congressional approval, speaking to uh, President Biden. This is illegal, she said, and violates Article One of the Constitution. The people do not want more of our taxpayer dollars going to endless wars and the killing of civilians. Val Hoyle, another uh, progressive congresswoman, also echoing those remarks in a post to X, as you see on your screen there. They're also getting uh, some backup on the other side of the aisle, though. You have constitutional Republicans like Mike Lee, who says this is above party, that this is something the, pre uh, the president does need congressional approval on. I will say, though, of course, Article 2 enables the president to conduct any strikes to protect national security interests, and that's exactly what you saw happen here. So not a whole ton of a surprise in terms of the mixed bag of reactions, but we will see if Republicans especially uh, put the pedal to the metal in demanding the Biden administration do more uh, to go after directly Iran in this conflict. All right, Julie Serkin, as always, we appreciate you joining us. The New York civil fraud trial involving former President Trump has come to a close. Now we await a decision from the judge who's presiding over the case. Closing arguments wrapped up yesterday in lower Manhattan with a decision expected in the coming weeks. The former president addressed the court, lashing out at the judge and at New York Attorney General Letitia James. James is seeking $370 million in fines from Trump and is also looking to ban him from the real estate industry here in New York. For more, let's bring in civil rights attorney, former prosecutor Chris and Gibbons Fedden. She's also an NBC News contributor. Kristen, good to have you with us. So let's begin with the former president addressing the court directly. Man, I wish we had cameras in court here. So his request to speak during closing arguments, it was initially denied yeah. by Judge and Goron. Trump's legal team again requested to have him speak when the judge asked if they promised to, quote, just comment on the facts and the law. Trump then began immediately talking without actually agreeing to that. What do you take? What are your takeaways from all this? What was your reaction to all this? You know, I think it was significant, but it is absolutely unusual for something like that to happen. But overall, what is the impact that it had on the trial? I think his closing remarks were really a blend of his campaign style address and, and a touch, maybe a touch of legal argument, really, because he denounced the trial as he as his narrative really was uh, as a political witch hunt. And then he asserted his innocence. But again, this approach was really more provocative than substantive because it really led to the judge admonishing Trump's lawyers to rein his client in. So with regard to the legal impact with his trial, not so great. And it really did underscore the contentious and dramatic nature of that trial. But ultimately, it, it supports his narrative with his campaign style rhetoric. Let's talk about the meat of some of these closing arguments. The judge questioned both sides as they were happening. What stood out to you? Uh, well, a couple things stood out, right? So the prosecution's closing remarks really centered around the theme that fraud was the Trump Organization's business model. And they really emphasized Trump's direct involvement in that fraud, and particularly in preparing the financial statement. So they reviewed the evidence that really highlighted Trump's active role in compensating executives and engaging in operations leading to those false statements. So they really centered in on the, his direct involvement. But they also had to counter the defense's narrative of Trump's unaware or really, from a legal perspective, the lack of intent to deceive. 
Um, but really what was important in this particular part was was uh, the judge's skepticism with regard to the liability for Donald Trump Jr. as well as Eric. And so what the prosecution really tried to do was to highlight their direct awareness and really for Donald Trump Jr., just that he really should have known. And the defense really did capitalize on that. Um, they said that there's no evidence. They really summarized their arguments by saying there were errors, there was reasonable reliance on professionals, but there wasn't fraud. Um, and they really argued that the awareness of the inflated value of the assets, if they were, was really what every business owner was doing, and that this was nothing more than a politically motivated selective prosecution. So if the judge ultimately does decide to fine Trump a lot of money, even bar him from mm -hmm. doing business in New York, then what are Trump's options after that? Well, Trump's options are really, really to continue his campaign style rhetoric. He's going to say that this is politically motivated. But from a real legal perspective, there was an appellate attorney in the room. And so I have no uh, belief other than to think they're going to directly appeal from any decision that the court makes. All right. Kristen Gibbons, Fedden, appreciate your expertise on this one. We'll stand by and wait for a decision, likely by the end of the month. Thank you so much. Well, millions of people are waking up to another wintry blast today with more severe weather expected this weekend. This latest system is bringing blinding blizzards in the Midwest, causing tornadoes in the south. But more details on the forecast when we check in shortly with meteorologist Angie Lassman. First, though, let's check in with NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa. She joins us from Chicago. Oh, boy. Look at that. <laughs> Portraits <laughs> of Maggie throughout the week. And no, I know. Snowy we, places. What is happening, Maggie? <laughs> we're in Boston, and then you were in Des Moines, and now you're in Chicago, and the whole time we have you out in the snow. At least you have good clothes. What's up, Maggie? Good morning. <laughs> Thank you. It's as awful as ever, guys. I so appreciate it. This is so fun. <laughs> like, but honestly, I just have to give you some context. When we got here for our live shot this morning, guys, there was literally no snow on the ground. I mean, understandably, our producer freaked out a little bit. Like, we're not going to have any snow for this weather live shot. All of this has hit and built up, started sticking in like the last hour and a half. So this bomb cyclone is hitting as we speak and it's hitting hard. Also, a couple of headlines this morning, more than 600 flights canceled today out of O'Hare and Midway airports and a ground stop just issued at O'Hare. So this is really having an impact. And as we know, so many communities across the country are bracing as this so-called bomb cyclone takes aim at people still digging and drying out from the latest round of severe weather the guys hit just a few days ago. This morning, the latest wave of brutal winter weather in the form of a bomb cyclone detonating across the country. With another round of twisters and hail hammering the south and blizzards slamming the Midwest with blinding snow and whipping winds causing whiteout conditions, snarling roads and blanketing neighborhoods. We're mainly dealing with accidents. Temperatures plunging well below zero, setting the stage for possibly the coldest Iowa caucus in history Monday, with wind chills expected to feel like 30 below. And more avalanches in the west. Near Stevens Peak in Idaho, authorities say two people were rescued, one is still missing. And a second avalanche in Lake Tahoe after one Wednesday killed one person and buried three others, including Jason Parker. You said you couldn't move. No, you, you can't move at all. It's, it's a scary feeling. Rescuers seen here digging for Parker, who was trapped under close to four feet of snow. They found him after eight minutes. I started yelling, help, help, as, as much as I could. My adrenaline's rushing. My, I just, uh, it, was, it, was so, it was surreal. In the Northeast, another round of torrential rain is set to worsen ongoing flooding. Rivers in New Jersey still rising from the last round of severe weather earlier this week. Hard hit communities nationwide preparing for more blows as Mother Nature shows no sign of letting up. Guys, that avalanche interview is going to stick with me for a while. We're so glad Jason Parker is okay. Uh, back here in Chicago, obviously this is a place people that are used to intense winter weather, but still officials are warning people. They say this is going to be so bad. It's already so bad. If they can, they want them to alter or cancel their morning commutes, work from home uh, if possible. And then the other differentiating factor of this storm is the brutal cold that now appears to be pushed off maybe a day or two or so. We're seeing a high of around 35 today, but when we get into the latter part of the weekend, into the middle of next week, guys. We're going to see hose for, uh, lows forecasted here below zero lingering through the middle of next week. So wow. this is a long 
messy road ahead. It's just wild how fast this is hitting, guys. Maggie, we're hearing, I'm hearing that we are going to send you to a different location, Arrowhead Stadium yeah, yeah. in Kansas City. It's going to be negative City. 30. It's a football game. It'll be fine. It'll yeah. be nice and warm. So fun. Oh, my Thank God. <laughs> Love that for me. Oh, Love my gosh. Thanks so Maggie, much. I, yeah, yeah. I know you have to talk to us about this probably like 100 more times yeah, all our colleagues throughout the day. So we're, I'd say go get warm. I don't know how long it's going to last, but we, we appreciate, appreciate you, it. Maggie. Thank you so Jinx. much. For more on appreciate the Sub-Zero Temps, we're expecting this weekend. Let's get your morning news now weather. Angie Lassman, what's going on? Good you morning. Guys, I know, I know. This is this is really difficult. Good morning to you. It's difficult for a lot of reasons. We've got multiple threats, multiple impacts when it comes to this same system. So let's start with one of the things that Maggie mentioned, the cold. We've got 23 million people already dealing with these wind chill alerts. You can see how expansive they are. They likely will expand more as the days goes on, as the days go on. But check these temperatures out right now. Minus four for Rapid City. Add in the those winds and we're talking 15 below look a little farther to the north more than 30 degrees below for what it feels like Minneapolis waking up to a temperature of just seven degrees and feeling like minus 11 as we get into Saturday Sunday Monday notice where our temperatures end up these are our minimum wind chills so nearly 20 below for for Denver for Saturday Sunday and Monday brutal cold dipping as far down south as portions of Texas we're gonna have uh, the, the wind chill feeling like zero degrees on Monday in Dallas and you might know that there's a couple of things going on across the country over the next couple of days. Football games, we've got the Iowa caucuses. We're going to uh, see this bitter cold really impact a lot of a lot of folks, especially places like Chicago. Single digit temperatures early into next week. Tuesday, just one degree. We'll see Cincinnati into the 20s. I mentioned the Iowa caucus. Here's what we've got going on. This is this is Monday, minus 42 for the wind chill in Fort Dodge, Missouri Valley, minus 35 for what it feels like, minus 34 in Sioux City. We've got Waterloo feeling like minus 36. So these are dangerous temperatures. It's not just how cold it is. It's those added winds of 30, 40, 50 mile per hour uh, gusts that we're going to see that are really going to make it dangerous for folks to be outdoors uh, for any prolonged period of time. And on top of that, we've got the snow that you saw in Chicago. That's going to be something that we deal with across portions of the Great Lakes through the next couple of days. We've got the wind alerts that I just mentioned and the flood alerts across portions of the east as we gear up for more heavy rain. And on top of that, more strong storms. We've already had an active warning across portions of the south. We've seen tornado warnings. We've got one active right now. We can see this tornado watch that is going to go through 11 a.m. central and includes portions of Louisiana uh, and stretching north up into, up into places like Memphis. So this is something we'll watch through the day today. There's that heavy snow in its wet snow. So it's going to be not just, uh, you know, it's not easy to get around. It's not easy to manage. And that's going to continue through the day today with really impressive uh, snowfall totals per hour. It's going to be really, really uh, a winter wonderland across that region. Meanwhile, 29 million people at, these, at risk for these severe storms through the afternoon and evening hours tonight. We do have a risk of tornadoes. We also have the potential to see wind gusts 70 to 75 miles per hour. So the down trees, down power lines, all going to be on the table. But of course, we want you to make sure that you have a way to get those tornado alerts if that is evolving and where you live. Here's how the system works through today and then into tomorrow. Notice it's moving out and most of the heavy rain exits, but we're still dealing with these really strong winds along the lakes. We don't have great ice coverage on the lakes, so that means that the lake effect snow machine is going to continue. It's going to be impressive. We'll see those intense snow bands all around the Great Lakes and giving us some really uh, good totals when it comes to now through Sunday. Those hourly rates one to two inches guys we could see places with up to a foot and a half of snow wow. again i mentioned it's wet snow we've got the really windy conditions it's going to be something to watch um for sure. People, I would recommend, you know, Maggie said officials saying don't leave your house. Yeah. I mean, this is this is good advice. Good We've, I, we're did I see 60 mile an hour winds in Buffalo? Yeah. <laughs> that, that does not sound fun. Also, another place that we have games going I was on. Yeah. Say. yeah. And even into MLK, uh, the holiday, it's going to be throw busy. football in 60 miles an hour? Uh, I'd like to see you try. <laughs> to be allowed to run it. Wouldn't you all? I, I hope <laughs> <laughs> that would be something to see. <laughs> Thanks, Kendry. Thank you. Much more to come on this Friday edition of Morning News Now Beyond the Physics of Football. We're going to talk about three, just three days away from the Iowa caucuses, what we're watching for from the remaining GOP candidates as the frigid clock ticks down. Plus, the time-honored caucus tradition for one Iowa mayor that's bringing national politics right into her living room. We're covering it all after this.
Welcome back. The Iowa caucuses kick off on Monday, and for the remaining Republican candidates bidding to be the next president, it's of course expected to be a busy weekend. Each candidate will be hoping to sway those undecided voters, although it's still looking like a race for second place between Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley behind the frontrunner, former President Donald Trump. That's right. For more, we are joined by NBC News senior national politics reporter Jonathan Allen. He is there. He is in beautiful downtown Des Moines, joining us from his hotel room. We very much appreciate it, John. So we're heading into this last weekend. Before the caucus, what are you watching for, specifically sort of this race for second, as Joe just said, between Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley? What do we know so far about who has that advantage? Right now I'm looking out my window and watching snow fall sideways, um, <laughs> <laughs> which, which makes all of this a little bit Good. more unpredictable. If you turn your head, it looks like it's going the right way, though. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, it looks like it looks like Savannah throwing a football in 60 mile per hour wind out there. Um, so, look, I, I think, you know, all of this is a little less predictable. We've already had Nikki Haley uh, uh, basically cancel rallies uh, today or turn them into tele tele town halls, uh, basically virtual events. I think we'll probably see more of that uh, from the candidates over the next couple of days. It's not just the snow, but also, uh, you know, we're expecting uh, temperatures to fall at well below zero on caucus day. So th that's a, the big wrinkle right now. Um, in terms of what's going on here at the end, uh, you got a pretty good organization by DeSantis on the ground, but it hasn't been able to get him to a place to compete with Trump. It hasn't been able to get him to a place uh, where he's outdistanced Nikki Haley to the point where um, he could be comfortable that he's going to come in second place. Uh, and Haley's done a pretty good job of, uh, of tempering expectations here, basically not setting a goal for herself. Uh, meaning that, uh, you know, it's, it, it would be hard to see her walk out of here, um, you know, as, uh, as, as the loser, even if she uh, were to come in third. So Trump has been pretty hands off in Iowa compared with the other candidates. What are we hearing from him? What's his strategy heading into the caucus now? Yeah, Trump has um, had a more robust organization on the ground here in Iowa than he has in the past. Uh, certainly than he did in 2016, but he has been to the state uh, less time, you know, less frequently uh, himself than the other candidates have. Uh, basically, he's in an expectation game against himself in terms of uh, everybody here expects him to win. Um, you know, the, the question is going to be, does he win with more than 50 percent of the vote, less than 50 percent of the vote. Some of his campaign aides uh, point to about a 12 point victory as being you know, a record for a Republican in a, in a competitive caucus here. So there's a, a lot of level setting uh, going on, but that's uh, everyone expects him to win. And John, a question on Chris Christie. NBC News is learning the No Labels Party is talking to some of his allies about a potential here of interest in a third party run. Uh, walk us through that, and of course, you know, this, there's always a conversation when somebody's talking about that about what impact that does have on, on you know, Republican and Democratic candidates. What does that mean? It's uh, supply and demand. Uh, <laughs> no labels needs a candidate. Uh, <laughs> Chris Christie likes to campaign. It makes sense that they would talk to each other. Um, it's not clear yet. No labels has figured out who they're going to have run, if anybody will run with them. But uh, if they're going to do it, they got to do it sooner than later. So not not shocked that they're. Uh, that they're talking to Christie, as our colleagues reported. Um, you know, what does it mean for the general election? Uh, I think we'd have to see, but uh, the possibility is that they would draw enough votes for uh, the winning party in, in states to affect the Electoral College map. There you go. John Allen, I'd like to see you try to throw the football <laughs> in 60 miles, by the way. <laughs> I got a pretty good arm, Savannah, but uh, 60 miles an hour seems like a lot. So. Uh, next time we're out in 60 degree weather, let's play catch. There right. we go. Sounds John, thank you so much. <laughs> Have fun in Iowa. Let's stay in Iowa with the mayor who is keeping an old tradition alive, holding precinct meetings for the caucuses in her home. The mayor of Silver City is preparing to host as many as 50 guests at her house. The gathering harkens back to an earlier time when neighbors came together to debate politics over coffee and bars, snacks. <laughs> yeah, and this time around, Mayor Sharon McNutt's Living Room Caucus is the last such meeting in the state. Isn't that amazing? All other GOP precincts are venues that are places like churches, schools, and community centers. And Mayor Sharon McNutt joins us now for more on this. Madam Mayor, good to have you with us. Thank you for joining us. So first of all, let me just tell us, how did this all come to be? When did you actually start hosting these in your home and why? Why'd you want to do this? 
Well, it started because I had booked the community center in our town for our, our caucus in 2002. And I was informed right before the caucus that, uh-oh, the Democrats had previously booked it. So <laughs> the only place to have it was my house. <laughs> then uh, it just continued. Every two years, we had it at our house. And in 2016, of course, we had 50 people here. We had uh, Omaha World Herald live streaming it. <laughs> and uh, just continued. And I said I wanted to live long enough to have the last one in Iowa. So here we are. There you go. <laughs> Goal achieved. And lucky for everybody else that the Democrats had it booked because I understand since it's at your house, it comes with cookies that I imagine are something, to, something special. Tell us what you're making. <laughs> well, I've made maple pecan. They're ready to bake. And I'm going to make cherry chocolate chip and some regular chocolate chip. And there's another lady that's going to bring some good cookies, too. So, And then a big pot of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds Sign good. Cherry chocolate chip. I like yeah, that. Wow. So what? How, without going into too much detail, how does this all work? Everyone gets to your place. Yeah. And then what is it you do? Well, first of all, they register, and if they are not registered Republicans, they can register that night. And I know that we have uh, two young men, they're twins that live here in town, that will be 18 by the general election. So they're able to register to, uh, Monday night and participate in the caucus. Then there are, I know we have someone that is a Democrat that's coming to register as a Republican. They're changing parties. So that all happens before we get started with everything else. After that, we go through our business meeting. We elect um, a permanent chair, secretary. Then we elect the central committee people for the next year and the uh, county convention delegates. We talk about the plaque planks for the platform, and then we um, hear from the candidates, representatives, and vote. Mm. I, I know uh, you had that goal of being the last one, but other than, than hanging on for that, why do you like doing this in your home? Why do you like preserving that part of the tradition? I, I have an idea that some of the traditions that we had in the past were um, more community and family minded people brought their kids they and they communicated with each other at these meetings and it was a homey thing it was a family thing and people could express their opinion freely in a home i believe it wasn't so institutional well especially in this day and age of everyone communicating online and in social media yeah. All right. Mayor Sharon McNutt, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate your time. Yeah. Wish you all the best. Can't wait to see those cookies. And please stay warm. Yeah, everyone's so lucky who gets to come over and eat those cookies at your, <laughs> at your beautiful house on Main Street. We really appreciate you. Thank you so much. By the way, to our viewers, you can follow all the headlines coming out of Iowa next week right here on NBC News Now. Kristen Welker, Hallie Jackson, Tommy Amis will have live coverage and analysis all night long starting on Monday at 7 p.m. Eastern. Coming up, Boeing is now the subject of yet another federal investigation. With the FAA now joining the NTSB in separate probes, trying to figure out what exactly went wrong with that scary mid-air blowout last week. The new action taking aim at the jet maker that was just announced by the FAA this morning. That's next on Morning News. Welcome back. The Federal Aviation Administration is launching an investigation into Boeing. It is seeing whether the plane maker failed to ensure the 737 MAX 9 was safe to fly before last Friday's mid-air blowout on an Alaskan Airlines flight forced the entire fleet to be grounded. NBC News senior correspondent Tom Costello joins us with more on this. So, Tom, the FAA has just announced it's increasing oversight of Boeing production and manufacturing. Yeah. Just, just walk us through what this entails and how this all relates to the investigation. So we've got several breaking news developments, and you're absolutely right. This latest one that you just mentioned there, the FAA in the last few minutes announcing it is increasing oversight of Boeing production. That's critical. Uh, it is also going to be auditing the MAX 9. That's the plane that we saw the incident with a week ago. Max 9 production, the line, its suppliers, uh, and also re-examining the process by which the FAA delegates inspection 
to Boeing representatives themselves. The FAA now saying it may be time for a third party to get in and, and inspect everything in the production line. This is a very big decision. And as you know, the NTSB is investigating how and why the so-called door plug on that MAX 9 blew off at a compression explosion. The FAA separately now launching its own investigation into whether Boeing failed to ensure its completed products, the planes, conformed to its approved design and were safe to fly. Now, the FAA says this incident should have never happened, and it says, quote, it cannot happen again. All 171 MAX 9s have been grounded worldwide in the U.S. That means Alaska Airlines and United fly the MAX 9. The airlines still waiting for guidelines from Boeing on how to inspect those grounded planes for signs of problems. Joe, I just a minute ago had the FAA chief in the elevator here. He tells me that the new directives are hundreds of pages long, which will speak to why it's taking so long, why the inspections haven't really even started yet on a formal basis. But both the NTSB, uh, sorry, but both Alaska Airlines and United Airlines have done preliminary exams, and they have already found loose bolts on their MAX 9s. So this is a problem. Both airlines are canceling hundreds of flights each day. That's expected to continue at least through Saturday, if not longer. So, Tom, how is Boeing responding to these investigations, and what are the potential implications for the company? Boeing has released a statement, and it says it will cooperate fully and transparently with the FAA and the NTSB in their investigations. Uh, listen, Boeing, uh, like all parties to an investigation, to an accident investigation, they are limited on what they can say because they are party to an investigation, but they are fully offering that they will fully cooperate. One more important point here, and that is, as we've said on this program before, Boeing received the fuselage for this plane by, from a company called Spirit Aerosystems. They, de they designed the tube, and the tube had that door plug that blew out. So this investigation is focused on Boeing, but also on Spirit Aerosystems, and now the FAA says it looks like it may need to increase oversight as well on Spirit. Lots of breaking news this morning. Tom Costello on top of all of it. Tom, thank you so much. Let's get some international headlines now. Britain's Prime Minister is in Kyiv this morning to announce more aid for Ukraine. NBC's Ali Arouzi joins us with that and more world headlines. Ali, good morning. Good morning, Joe. Good morning, Savannah. That's right. British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak is in Kyiv today to announce an increase in military funding to help Ukraine purchase new military drones, including surveillance, long-range strike and sea drones. London has been one of Kyiv's staunchest supporters since Russia's invasion, and Sunak said Britain would increase its support in the next financial year to almost $3.2 billion. The two countries will also sign a historic UK Ukraine agreement on security cooperation. Late last year, Pope Francis made a landmark declaration allowing priests to offer blessings to same-sex couples, which was welcomed by the LGBTQ Catholics. But African Catholic bishops are not happy, issuing a statement refusing to follow Pope Francis's declaration, permitting priests to offer blessings to same-sex couples, saying that such unions were contrary to the will of God. The pushback underscores a gap between the Pope's progressive, reform-oriented Orientated leadership and conservatives in much of the Catholic community. And finally, just when you thought the whole world had been mapped out, a patchwork of a lost valley of cities in Ecuadorian Amazon has been discovered in the rainforest that was home to at least 10,000 farmers 2,000 years ago. Recent mapping by laser sensor technology revealed those sites to be part of a dense network of settlements connecting roadways tucked into the forest foothills of the Andes that lasted about a thousand years. An extraordinary find. And those are your headlines, guys. No kidding, Ali. Thank you. Well, the NFL playoffs kick off this weekend, but they come after a week of some major changes on the sidelines. NBC News correspondent Kaylee Hartug is in Kansas City, where, as we've been discussing, tomorrow the Chiefs will take on the Dolphins in what is expected to be one of the coldest playoff games ever played. Hey there, it's about 20 degrees right now in Kansas City, and if you can believe it, by tomorrow night's game, temperatures could drop 30 more degrees. As much as this could impact the play on the field and the fans in the stands, the excitement for playoffs is just beginning, even as dramatic coaching decisions change the landscape of the NFL. 
The postseason is firing up in the bitter cold as 12 teams look to make it past Wild Card Weekend. It all starts tomorrow as the Dolphins leave warm Miami for the icy gridiron in Kansas City. At kickoff, the temperature at Arrowhead expected to be just one degree. And with the wind chill, it's going to feel more like 17 below. That would make it the coldest game in Dolphins history and is sure to impact two of the league's high-flying offenses. Can't prepare for a game like that with that kind of weather, so it'll be new. The defending Super Bowl champs determined not to let the elements disrupt their rhythm. I just say, get ready for the game. Let's do that. I don't really care what goes on out here. Yeah, we're not having a snowball fight. In Houston, a unique quarterback clash. Cleveland Brown's Joe Flacco looking to continue his resurgence, gunning for an NFL record eighth career postseason win on the road just days before his 39th birthday, while Texans rookie C.J. Stroud aims to become the youngest quarterback to win an NFL playoff game at just 22 years old. I'm really excited playing my first playoff game, of course, and it's been a goal of mine since I've been a kid. But storylines on the field, no match for the shakeups on the sidelines. Just hours after Seahawks head coach Pete Carroll stepped aside after 14 seasons with the team, Patriots legendary head coach Bill Belichick announced he would hang up his hoodie. Robert and I, after a you know, series of discussions, have uh, mutually uh, agreed to um, part ways. Belichick built a dynasty in New England over 24 seasons winning six Super Bowl titles, all of them with Tom Brady under center. The quarterback writing, I'm incredibly grateful to have played for the best coach in the history of the NFL. We accomplished some amazing things over a long period of time. I could never have been the player I was without you, Coach Belichick. While Belichick still has the third best record in league history, his departure comes after the worst season of his career. Still, the future Hall of Famer says he's excited for the future. It's with um, just so many fond memories and, and uh, thoughts that I you know, think about the Patriots and, and uh, I'll always be a Patriot. After all those years in New England, Bill Belichick is someone who knows how to brave these elements. As much as players have to prepare for it on the field, you got to think about the fans and the stands, too. And here at Arrowhead, home of the defending Super Bowl champions, their attendance has been better than ever this season. But we're expecting a few thousand seats to be empty here. And as bad as we think it is here... Let me tell you, in Buffalo, they are expecting blizzard conditions as the Bills host the Steelers on Sunday. Back to you. All right, yeah, thank you, Kaylee. Yeah, that's where I'd be throwing that ball. No, and throwing that football in the 60-mile and hour winds. winds in a blizzard. Also, I wonder, why has their attendance been so good? <laughs> Anything to do with uh, Miss Taylor Swift? Perhaps, perhaps, perhaps. Although now they're also in the playoffs. There's that, yes. too. All right, coming perhaps, up, here Joseph. is a question for all you New Year's resolutioners out there. What's nutrition going to look like in 2024? Probably won't come as a surprise. AI could change the way we think about food. We will take you to the cutting edge of tech up next. So with all the other demands on your time, it can be difficult to track your health and keep an eye on what you eat. Yeah, so hard to try to do it in one of those apps or something. Well, what if artificial intelligence could do it for you by taking a picture of your food? NBC News correspondent Steve Patterson got a first look at how AI is cooking up a new way to look at your plate. Technology is changing the way we think, how we drink, and even how we eat. It's all happening at the Consumer Electronics Show. Meet Nuvi Lab's AI food scanner. It uses 3D scanning technology to determine the nutritional value of the meal you're about to eat and how much of it is consumed during that meal. Food looks delicious, it's not real, but if it were, I could put it on my plate like this. Let's say grab some sushi, some asparagus. When you've got a meal like this, you can scan it. It'll tell you exactly what's on the plate, how many calories it is, just like that. And then when you're done, it subtracts that to tell you how much you're eating and intaking. From there, the information from the scans is given to you in a report showing nutrition and consumptions, helping people in real-life scenarios, like giving diabetics another tool to maintain glucose levels or helping parents figure out the kinds of nutrients their children really need to grow. It's very granular. <laughs> For restaurant owners, the data can also show how many diners came in and what was left over. So it'll tell you how much food is being wasted per year? Per year, per day, per, per day. minute. Per minute. Wow. 
A new way for business owners to see exactly what's still on the plate and in the trash. Previously, uh, people's been eyeballing and then they've been esti estimating uh, how much of what is being wasted right. and then we give out the accumulated information. The hope is that food scans can help beyond restaurants and reach more groups that need help tracking nutrition. It can be hospitals, universities, uh, daycare, long-term care facilities. Soon enough, AI is going to make tracking what you eat and what you don't a piece of cake. <laughs> we see what you did there. Thank you, Steve Patterson. <laughs> some financial headlines now, starting with CVS pulling some of its locations out of Target stores. CNBC Silvana Hanau is back with us with that and other news. Hey, Silvana. Hey, Savannah. Hey, Joe. Yes, yeah, so CVS Health will, will close some pharmacies operating inside Target stores over the next few months. Those prescriptions from those stores will be transferred to a nearby CVS store. Pharmacy chains, including CVS rival Walgreens, have been cutting costs to offset lower spending by consumers hit by inflation. CVS has nearly 1,800 pharmacies inside Target stores nationwide. The company declined comment on which locations will be affected, but says employees will be offered a comparable position elsewhere. Disney's Pixar studio is reportedly set to cut jobs as it's completed production on some shows and now has staff it doesn't need. TechCrunch says Pixar may cut as many as 20% of its workforce this year. Sources tell Reuters Pixar has yet to determine the exact number and nothing is imminent. Disney CEO Bob Iger has signaled the company will reduce the amount of streaming content it makes to keep a lid on costs and will license shows and movies from outside producers. Speaking of Pixar, a trio of Pixar movies are heading to the big screen for the first time. Starting this weekend, those films that were initially released only on Disney Plus during the pandemic will get their chance to shine in theaters. The first movie you can catch is Soul, which opens in theaters today. Turning Red debuts on February 9th, followed by Luca on March 22nd, guys. Very cool, Fun. Savannah. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank Appreciate you. it. Coming up, we've got a very special can't miss list for you this Friday morning. Ladies and gentlemen, Ariana Grande. Grande is back. After the break, we're digging into her new single, Yes And, and all the other can't miss content for your weekend. Stay with us. It is Friday, which means it's time for everything you can't miss in theaters, on TV, and of course in your earbuds this weekend. Ooh, that's right. We've got Kay Ingram joining us this morning. Good morning. I'm so happy to be here with you today. I'm so happy to be here too, always. <laughs> Thanks for having me, y'all. Of course, we have to start with Mean Girls, which yes. of course was a movie, and then it was a Broadway musical, so now that is what has inspired the new take mean on Mean Girls, the movie, the musical. Exactly. Adaptation on adaptation. <laughs> adaptation, yeah. but of course, it's the OG classic, and what's exciting is we have some OGs there, right? So we've got Tina Tina Fey, we've got Tim Meadows, they're back, they're doing their classic roles from the OG Classic, but we've got some new folks too. We've got John Hamm, um, we've got a whole bunch of folks who are just really excited uh, to be in this, you know, adaptation of an OG Classic, and folks cannot wait. They're saying the box office is going to do 20 to like 35 million dollars, which is incredible because it it's 36 to make. So imagine making all that wow. in a weekend. Right. Yeah. So a lot of mixed reviews, though. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We'll yeah. See, I mean, I think it's, it's, it it's hard life? because everyone remembers the first one so right. fondly because it wasn't that long ago. We yes. watched it just this past weekend because we just love it so much. So <laughs> it's yeah. classic. There'll always be those comparisons. But. Totally. Oh, but I'm very excited to see it. I'm happy yeah. to see that there's predictions it's going to do well. All right. What else, if we want to head to theaters this weekend, what else is coming out? Yes. Yeah, so also out in theaters, we've got um, the Book of Clarence. And so we go from Burn Book <laughs> yeah. to the Book of Clarence. <laughs> and um, this one is starring Lakeith Stanfield. And what's awesome about this, I mean, I'm a Lakeith fan, first of all, but what's awesome is he plays this guy who is really going through it. He is down and out. Um, he's got a huge debt that he's trying to pay off. He also has a love interest that he's hoping to gain the attention of. So what better than to try and play the most famous followed person of his time? And I'm not talking about a Kardashian. It's <laughs> like 8,300, uh, 300 AD, I should say. And I'm talking about Jesus. Christ. Jesus. <laughs> so we can only imagine how that's going to go, right? Um, and it's really cool because, of course, you have Lakeith, you've got David Oyelowo, um, Jay Z was yeah. a producer for this. I know, right? <laughs> I, fun? I, I saw it I was in the movies this last week and I saw the preview for it and it's pretty good. I mean, yeah. it looks very funny. It's very, Doesn't like, it's a brilliant it? idea. Yeah. So Biblical I think comedy. That's a, yeah. 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 All, right. <laughs> All right. Let's do, let's, yeah, exactly. Let, let's do a mix of movie and TV here. But we're talking about, like, sort of, we got a prequel to Ted. Yeah. Yes. Which is going to be yeah. movies, and then True Detective, which people love 
I think people yeah. still think so fondly of the original one with Matthew McConaughey and Woody Harrelson. Did a I new hear chapter you're a fan? in that. I love yeah, he's True a huge Detective. fan. I love, love that. Yeah. Yes. Come on, True Detective fan. <laughs> um, yeah, so we've got Ted, and that is the prequel of sorts, mm -hmm. right? So if you've been wondering about John and Ted and <laughs> what their wondering. life <laughs> was like before they met, you just sit it's around just wondering. It's been really bothering you. you. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's been keeping you up at yeah. night. Here is the backstory. We are going back to the 90s with this prequel. <laughs> it's now available on Peacock. You can stream it right now. Um, it's a seven episode series, and so we really get the full backstory oh, wow. okay. context. I've heard it's hilarious. Was like. And no surprise. I mean, it's Ted. Seth MacFarlane's awesome. Yeah. 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 Oh, wow. yeah. <laughs> and with True Detective. Yes. Not All hilarious. Right. Your fan probably. favorite. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I know. So um, it's giving crime. It's giving uh, Jodie Foster. It's giving. Which right. is awesome. Uh, exactly. Uh, Kaylee Reese, who is a boxer, a professional boxer to start. Oh, okay. So that's a fun tidbit. But now her biggest match in this series is trying to figure out this mystery behind these eight men who have disappeared from this Alaskan research lab and trying to find them. So it should be good. Is this a show that I should like start from the beginning? Is this well, like the, Diamond a Season different, 1? A different story. Oh, yeah. so I should just jump in. Now, and now, oh, that's great to know. Yes, exactly. All right, maybe, maybe that's what I am not though. missing You can watch any season you want. Yeah, yeah. okay, cool. All right. Um, all right, let's talk Ariana Grande. Let's dive in on some music. So she has a new album coming out. Do we, I don't know if we know when, but we just got the single. Right. So you're exactly right, Savannah. We don't know when. We also don't know the title of it. But that single that came out today, today's a big day, is Yes And. And it's got a comma and an, a question mark. A question so mark. Lots of yeah. punctuation. Right. Yeah. Lots of punctuation. Because she's making a statement. She's going like, yes and. <laughs> Period. The camera's so, not focused. It's, yeah. there's a... <laughs> well, what's funny is this photo, that's already been confirmed that that is one of the album covers. Ah. But again, we don't know the title. That's TBD. But we do know that this song is out. Um, before it was released, already it was up 200,000%, I think it was, on Spotify for folks creating playlists around this. Uh, so the hype is big because it's been three years since we've gotten a single from Ariana Grande. And it's very dancey for her. It's dancey. You it's guys bogey, are saying kind of sounds Madonna. Madonna. Yeah, yeah. 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 It, it, exactly. It feels like Vogue a little bit, yes. a little bit of reference That's there. the inspo. All so right. there you go. Got happy it. watching, happy listening. Hey, Ingram, thank you so much for joining us. Always fun having you so on. So great to have you here. Thank you. That is going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. Don't go anywhere. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.